Okay, so let's <clears throat> let's move forward uh, and start looking at how do we add friction uh, into the into the mix in a problem like this, you know, where we've got a uh, a setup here, you know, of a child holding a sled on an incline here, and the the problem here stated that we're on a frictionless hill, which means we're not going to look at friction, but it's important for us to look at um, how do we deal with putting friction into the mix, you know, so. In this problem, we would take the, again, the components apart. The only thing that uh, we're looking at here in this problem is the slide itself or the sled itself. And you can see here how we've set up the free body diagram superimposed over the top of the, of the sled. And you'll notice now we're in the um, traffic light problem. We had just the force of gravity. Uh, dependent on the the weight of the light. Well, this in this case we've got components then of the force of gravity, um, the tension in the cable, and that normal force. And that normal force is what we have to start looking at in terms of friction. So let's look at you know uh, how we attack a problem like this one before we get to anything like this. So we've got a term called the coefficient of friction. And the coefficient of friction will depend upon, again, whether the problem is a static problem, nothing's moving, or we do have components of the system that is that are in fact moving. So let's start with the coefficient of static friction. The magnitude of the force of static friction between any two surfaces in contact can have values. And so we've got this little f, which denotes friction, and a little sub s. So this f sub s is the static friction. And you'll notice now we don't have an equals or you know or a definition. We've got the static friction, this coefficient of friction relationship is less than or equal to something called mu s, where mu s is in fact the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So that little n is is the force. So as we, let's go back here, as we look at this, there is n, and what we're not showing in this problem here is that there is a, um, there is a coefficient of friction involved. So where the dimensionless constant mu s, it's just, it just becomes a multiplier, it's just a number, is called the coefficient of static friction, n is the magnitude of the normal force. So the friction static is actually a force component and it, it is comprised of how hard is it for an object to maintain that position let's say of this where the where the if if the rope wasn't here and the child wasn't holding it and this thing were just sitting there on the incline the static friction or the coefficient of friction in this case is holding it in place okay so we're looking at all of the static friction that's making this thing stay in equilibrium. On the other side of that, there's something called the coefficient of kinetic friction. The coefficient of kinetic friction, then, is the magnitude of the force of kinetic friction acting on an object. So if we look at, if we think in terms of the, of the sled, as long as the sled is just sitting there, it's being held in place by the force of static friction and the coefficient. Once it just breaks loose and the sled starts to slide down the incline, now we're talking about a different kind of friction because the object is moving, there's still friction involved, and we end up with a friction force less than the static friction. And that's what the little k is here. So now you'll notice it says it is equal to mu k times n. So mu k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. The values of mu s and mu k depend on the nature of the surfaces, but mu k is generally less than mu s. So if we were on a slippery, icy slope, that kinetic friction is going to be way different than on a flat surface or on a, uh, let's say, a, a dirt or gravelly or rock surface, okay? So we've got two, we basically have two parts of a problem that can exist. We've got a problem that can exist where we've got all mu s, and then once the thing starts moving, all mu k. And so we've got kind of a boundary there, a dividing line 
between the two that we will have to look at. So if we look at a problem here, a trash can, you know what it's like when you drag your trash can out to the curb? Well, if we look at the trash can and the mu and the, and the uh, free body diagram, you'll notice we've got the weight of the trash can, mg. We've got the normal force, which is on the bottom, on between the surface of the can and the surface of the ground. We've got some static friction that's preventing it from moving, and we've got some force of you grabbing onto the handle and trying to move it. So this entire piece here is you'll know that you notice that the frictional force or the force is rising, 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 rising to some point where the trash can just breaks loose. From here to here, the trash can's not moving. As soon as it breaks loose, you'll notice that the frictional coefficient changes from mu s to mu k, and the can starts to move, and then we have some constant value of force. So at this point, the frictional force of coefficients of, of kinetic friction takes over and now we have mu k times n. So we have two regions for this pro for this problem. Up to the point where it starts to move and from the point where it's moving continuously. So let's take a look at an example here. Moving into a dormitory. At the beginning of a new semester term, school term, a student moves a box of books by attaching a rope to the box and pulling with a force of 90 newtons and the angle made by the rope from the surface from the horizontal is 30 degrees okay so he's pulling up on it as he as he's pulling the box the box of books has a mass of 20 kilograms okay so that's not the weight of the box that's 20 kilograms of mass that you would have to multiply times 9.8 meters per second squared the coefficient of kinetic friction between the bottom of the box and the floor is 0.500, okay? Find the acceleration of the box. So now we're on that side of the, of the relationship where the box is moving. Okay, the reasoning here is that A, we're going to find the normal force N by applying the first condition of equilibrium. So it's up to that point, everything's static, in the vertical direction and we're going to sum all the forces in the y direction to zero. Okay, nothing is moving. Then we calculate the force of kinetic friction on the box from F sub k, or the friction, is equal to mu kn. And then finally apply Newton's second law along the horizontal direction to find the acceleration of the box. So let's analyze the free body diagram. Again, in the free body diagram, let's start with the force of gravity, mg. That is um, that, that is modeled as center of mass for the weight of the box. On the opposite side of mg is the normal, okay? So the normal is modeled as the place between the bottom of the box and the surface that it's being slid on. On the tension side, the rope is being pulled at 90 Newtons. Okay, notice that it's going to be a component of 90 Newtons. So we've got, we've got a cosine factor that we're going to have to bring in here since the rope is kind of pulling up. And this is going to add to us being able to break that box loose and start dragging it. On the opposite side, we're looking at the kinetic uh, coefficient uh, of motion as Fk. So we've got all of these forces that we're going to have to model and start looking at in each dimension. So the solution then, we say the box is not accelerating in the vertical direction so we can find the normal force. There's nothing a part of the problem between the normal and the weight that is, is really going to lend to the box moving in the x direction. So we, we say that all of the forces in the y direction are in equilibrium. The forces then in the y direction are the force of gravity, F sub g or mg, the normal force, N, and the vertical component of the applied 90 uh, newtons of force. The vertical component has then a magnitude equal to 90 times the sine of 30. So we've got that other component right there 
which is our vertical component. This is our horizontal component, cosine 30. This is our normal sine of 30. So if we sum all of our components in the y direction, and it's in equilibrium, we have the forces in the y direction is equal to the normal, which is positive, plus the force, or the tension on the rope, sine of theta, which is going to end up being um, our 90 times the sine of 30, minus the weight of the box, Fg, and we set that equal to 0. So if we look at, well, let's, what is Fg? What is the weight of the box? Well, the weight of the box was given as the mass, and we had to bring in the, um, the gravity, so the acceleration of gravity. So 20 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared gives us then F sub G, the weight of the box. So now if we look at our relationship then, where we use Mg now, so we have the normal plus the tension times the sine of 30 degrees, or sine theta, minus Mg equals zero. So we start dropping our numbers in here. We don't have a normal given to us, but we know that the force and the upward uh, uh, component here is going to add to that in the y direction. So the normal plus 90 newtons times the sine of 30 degrees minus 20 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared is again equal to zero. We are in equilibrium in the y direction. So when we combine all of our terms that have numbers then we have the normal plus 45n, that's 90 times the sine of 30, minus 196 newtons, which is now the weight of the box, equals zero. We are able to solve for the normal. The normal is 151 newtons. So the magnitude of the normal force is not equal to the weight of the box because we've got some of it being lifted because the vertical component of the 90 degree force is helping to support some of the weight. So now knowing the normal force, we can find the force of kinetic friction. So we go back to the definition. The definition says F sub K is equal to mu KN. Mu K was given to us as 0.5, and now we know the normal is 151 newtons. So the frictional force, the kinetic frictional force, is 75 and a half, and that's to the left, because that's back pull, pulling in this direction. Finally, then, we can determine the horizontal acceleration using Newton's second law. You'll notice now we're not in equilibrium. We are now in motion. So we are going to switch to the x-axis. F sub k is going to equal to the summation of the force cosine theta, that's the tension in the rope, minus mu k, that's the frictional force in the opposite direction. And now, instead of setting it equal to 0, we set it equal to mass times acceleration. So solving, we have 90 newtons times cosine of 30 degrees minus 75 and a half newtons, which we just solved for for the coefficient uh, of, of force kinetic. And we set that equal to the mass of the box, 20 kilograms. But we do not know the acceleration in the x direction. That wasn't given to us. So with all of this, what can we solve for? We can solve for the acceleration. So running this through your calculator, 90 newtons times the cosine of 30 minus 75 and a half newtons is equal to, uh, and it's going to be divided by 20 kilograms, is equal to an acceleration in the x direction of plus 0.122 meters per second squared. Okay, so now we have the acceleration associated with moving the box on the floor. <clears throat> so now what we have to do is we're going we're to have to go back to our motion equations. So if the initial speed of the box is zero, what is the speed after it's traveled for two meters? So we're going to pull the box two meters along the floor. Let's determine at what speed it's going to do that. So how long does it take to pull it that distance once we've solved for it? 
So now we go back to our motion equation. So we need to pick an emotion, a motion equation that has some of the values that we just solved for. Well, we don't know the velocity, and that's what we're solving for. We do know the acceleration in the x direction, okay? And we do know um, that we're going to pull it 2 meters, so that's what x is. So what we're going to do now is look at, are there any terms in here that go to 0? Well, this velocity initial squared is 0. Why? Because the problem said if the initial speed of the box is 0. So you have to pick up on these clues in the problem to tell you what things go to 0. So x that out. It's gone. So all we're left with is the velocity squared is equal to 2 times the acceleration in the x direction times the distance that it moves 2 meters. So I take the square root of both sides and I get 2ax, the square root. Now I can put my terms in 2 times 0.122 meters per second squared, which is the acceleration in the x direction times the 2 meters that we're going to move the box. And when we do that, solve for velocity, we get 0.699, or about 7 tenths of a meter per second. Now we can solve the second half of the equation. How long does it take to pull the box that distance? So again, we've got to go back into our toolbox, find the relationship that has terms that we have solved for to help us solve for the unknown. Well, in this case, we're looking for a factor of time. We now have velocity terms, we have the acceleration terms, we have the distance, we know that the initial velocity is zero, so this whole equation simplifies down to, since this goes to zero, the distance is equal to one-half the acceleration in the x direction times time squared. We want to solve for time. So let's move everything that isn't time to the other side of the relationship. Let's normalize it by putting the time on the left side Time squared is equal to 2x divided by a. Time is equal to the square root of 2x divided by a. And in solving that through, we end up with a time of 5.73 seconds. Okay? So now we have the velocity after the box starts moving and the time it takes to move it two meters. Okay, so let's stop there. We'll come back to a little different problem um, where we've got, again, friction involved.